Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. And today we're continuing in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God. And we're going to cover a couple of verses today. Last week it was just, the last time I preached, I just covered one, but today it's going to be two. Let me read those verses to you. Ephesians 6, 15 and 16 from the ESV. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, and in all circumstance, I'll wait for that to settle down a little bit. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us what we need to be able to stand firm when there are these attacks that come against us as Christians. May we learn what you've said, believe what you've said, and apply it um, by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So stand in gospel readiness is what the passage is teaching us. So let's go to verse 15. As I read, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, as I point out on the slide here, this is an allusion. It's not a direct citation, even though the New American Standard treats it as that, as a direct citation, but it's really an allusion because some of the same exact Greek words are there, but without you know, word for word citing it, okay? And Isaiah 52, 7, by the way, when you see LXX, that's just Roman numerals for 70. And there's only so much room on a slide. Septuagint's a long word. Somebody asked me, what's the LXX? Why is that in your sermon? That is the... Greek Old Testament most often cited by the New Testament writers. So now you know what that is when you see it. It's Roman numerals. And um, let me read Isaiah 52, 7 to you. Isaiah 52, 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns, your God reigns. So the idea of the feet, feet, the word feet are there and peace and salvation and so on certainly applies. So it's an allusion to Isaiah 52, 7. Paul actually cites part of this verse more literally, in Romans 10, in verse 15. How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written, and then citing Isaiah 52, 17. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. And so, using the idea from Isaiah 52, 7, of the gospel of peace, Paul is taking up here another illustration of the armor of God by which we stand against the continual onslaughts of the evil one against us as Christians and our faith and our strong standing in it. So the battle is real. The battle is a spiritual battle. Paul's already mentioned the type of beings, spiritual beings, that are part of the attack against us. And so now he's telling us, as we continue from the last time I preached, how we stand. Now the idea of stand is controlling this whole section. It's mentioned several times previously, and as I pointed out last week, there's an imperative, stand. It's very strong. Stand. So we stand in this, stand firm. And 
I mentioned the last time I preached on this, or one of the times, that some people think that isn't enough. They want to go out and take territory. I'll deal with that in my applications, what this has to do with territory. And when we get to the sword of the spirit, I'll point out how ground is actually gained, but in a way that we might not think, okay? For now, we want to know what is being said. Stand firm. And so our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. And readiness is a key idea. Always ready. There is no time off from the battle. It's always right there. So readiness is always necessary. The attacks against our confidence in Christ, against the finished work of Christ, against our standing in Christ, are relentless. Now, as I pointed out last time, there are four air participles that cover this section and stand uh, really is being modified or explained by these four participles. And those are this, I, me I mentioned last time. Having gird, another put on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we saw that, our right standing in Christ, having shod our feet with gospel readiness, that's right here, and then also today, having taken up the shield of faith. So those four are all modified by stand, that's how we do it. Now what are these shoes? The illustration is based on a reality of the Roman soldier and how they would be equipped for battle. And the Ro Rome was well known for having a great military and being well equipped to do battle. So we're going to be that way too. We're going to be well equipped. What were these shoes like? Dr. Honer comments on the military shoes of Roman soldiers. I'll quote him. These were not running sandals, but ones able to dig in with their hollow-headed hobnails and stand against the enemy. So it would be the kind of military equipment where you're going to dig in and they're not going to be able to move you. Remember earlier I preached the, the wrestle metaphor, wrestling against these spiritual forces in the ancient wrestling match, the point was to knock somebody off their feet. If you can get them off their feet, then you win. So stand certainly is the key issue. And so these military shoes that would dig in would make it possible to stand. They're not going to knock you off your feet. And so the, we want to look at each part of this, and then let's look at readiness. And this word for readiness in the Greek here is used only once in the New Testament, and that's right here. And it could also be translated preparation. So perhaps your Bible translates this preparation. That's also a correct way to say it. And so here, this readiness is having, sh uh, as having shod is a third of these four participles. So we stand having the right shoes on. And what is that? Readiness of, gospel, of the gospel, the gospel of peace. So what is this peace? What is important here? Peace has a range of meaning, but what does it mean right here? Well, let's have a little review. If you want to turn with me, Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Let's review what we learned earlier about peace and why it's so important as a gospel issue. In my applications today, we'll be looking at Romans 5.1 about having peace with God. What does that mean? Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. It says this, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might 
make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. So, to summarize that, remember the one new man is very important. It's a definition of the church here. The church is the one new man built on the foundation, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets, the authoritative ones of the New Testament being the foundation. And it's comprised of the one new man, Jews and Gentiles who have been reconciled to God through the gospel. Okay? So our standing is through what God has done through the gospel. And it doesn't matter where you came from. And in that world of the, the enmity between the Jews and the rest of the world, that had been going on since God chose Abraham. Still going on to this day. And Paul was very adamant that in the church, because we're one in Christ, there's no enmity between a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian. The two are one. So this peace is both horizontal and vertical. It's peace with God because we're reconciled to him. It's peace between Jew and Gentile because as we come to Christ, we're reconciled to God and to one another. Okay? So peace in the church is grounded in the reconciliation of every single believer to God through the cross. We learned that earlier, Ephesians 2, 14 and 16. And this peace with God is very important to know this. This peace with God refutes Satan's accusations. The theme that will underlie all of this is that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Last time we went back into Zechariah and saw how uh, the uh, the the Satan, the accuser, was accusing him, Joshua, the filthy high priest at the time, and he was giving, given clean garments, right to the righteousness of God. So peace is peace with God, and it's a reconciliation that God does. It's both vertical and horizontal. One more passage, just jot this one down. You don't have to turn to it. I'll read it to you. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. Jesus said this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. Nor let it be fearful. So Jesus says, I've given you peace. Do not let your heart be troubled. The word in the Greek for troubled could be translated agitated. It's very easy, dear brothers and sisters, to become agitated, it sure is for me, given the pathetic situation in our country and in the world around us. There's an awful lot of stuff to agitate us. And it's not expected that we're going to like or be at peace with the wickedness in the world around us. In the world, you do have tribulation. But what we need in this battle is this gospel readiness given by the gospel of peace. And so Jesus gives peace by reconciling us to the Father and by being our Lord. And we cannot allow anything from Satan, anything of the world, to ever take away our gospel peace. Because God gave it to us. And therefore, we have these military shoes, we're standing, we're dug in, and we're not going to back down. We have peace with God. Now let's go to the shield of faith, Ephesians 6, 
16a. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. And this is again one of the key things that we have to have. And we're still thinking about stand. Remember the imperative? Stand. Four participles. This is another one. The fourth one. Take up literally is having taken up. So we already have faith, but we need to stand in that faith. It's our shield. Our faith in God and his promises is the shield that is going to keep us from being pierced through and burned up by the flaming darts. I'll get to that in the next slide. And these are very real literary, literal military um, illustrations. I mean, it's not a literal shield, but this is the kind of thing that they did in a battle. And I'll explain that to you. So this says here, and this is a very good translation, so I chose the ESV, in all circumstances, literally. Um, it just says in all, but here it means in all circumstances or all situations. There's no situation that will ever come upon you as a Christian in which you're not going to need this shield of faith. And any possible thing, we're under providence, God's in control of all things, but he allows us to go through the trials and tribulations of life. And he has a greater good for that, as we saw see when we study Romans chapter 8. But as we go through those trials, the circumstances are many. We pray for one another. We have a prayer chain. We pray. God answers prayers. We care about each other. We've got to be there for each other. But in every possible circumstance, be it financial or uh, medical or just the sick world we live in that we see getting worse, uh, thing, the restriction of our freedom to do the things that we love to do, we've been going through that. There are all these circumstances. And we are assured that no matter what they are, this shield of faith is necessary. We must take it up. We have taken it up. We need to stand behind the shield of faith so that those fiery darts don't pierce our very soul. We'll get to that in a bit. There's no circumstance where you will not need this. We stand in faith. And so we take up the whole armor of God, and one part of that is the shield of faith. I believe now faith here, even though it doesn't have a definite article in the Greek, that's not the final say about whether it's objective or subjective. And as I read the scholars, and I read several of them who comment on this, one, surprisingly to me, thought it was subjective. Let me explain the difference. Objective is based on something outside of ourselves. What God did, what God said, what God promised. That we're standing in. Subjective would be our faith in God, our, our demeanor of faithfulness and trust in God, which is important. But in this context, because it is about the battle of standing against those fiery darts of the accuser, it has to be in context objective. Let me tell you why. When we're accused and attacked and pushed to the limit. And the accuser is after us. Are you going to stand because you're focused on what Christ said and what Christ did? Or you're going to stand because you believe you have a lot of faith? I'll tell you why, and that's important too. I'm not diminishing it. They're both true, but here's why the objective is so important. It's impenetrable. 
Did I say that right? I think I did. Pretty big word for a farm boy. Uh, Satan can't get through that. Why? I'll show you this from the scripture when we go to Revelation 12. How did they overcome the accuser? Um, It has to be based on the blood of Christ and what he did for us. Because we can very easily succumb to self-doubt. And we know that we're not perfected yet. And that's attackable. If you're going to attack somebody, you attack their own weakness or character flaws or doubts. But if we're standing in the objective faith of God's gospel promises, when Abraham stood in faith, promise given to him in his old age, He had to stand on the promise of God. In fact, let's turn to that uh, as I'm talking about Genesis 15.1. Because I want to talk about the shield as used in the Old Testament. Genesis 15.1. I didn't make mention of that on the slide, but I want to preach on it. I'll give you a moment. Genesis 15, by the way, is the chapter where God cuts covenant with Abraham, Abram. They cut the animals in two, and the two parties to the covenant are going to walk the blood path. And then the covenant says, may God do to me what happened to this animal if I don't keep my part. But in this chapter, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a theophany, God himself goes through the parts. So this is a unilateral covenant. Look at verse 1. And after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, quote, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. And your reward will be very great. So when Abraham, before Abram, before he became Abraham, was about to enter in with covenant with God, he was told, I am your shield. Okay? And so the shield is the God and his promises and our trust in him. I think that is consistent in the Bible. Now let me explain what that shield actually was. I have it on the slide here. For the Roman soldier, that's where these analogies are coming. And so it was a large, heavy shield made of layers of wood planks covered with leather. In fact, they used fresh calf skins many times, not cured ones. I'll tell you why in a moment. Wood planks, leather, canvas, metal trim on the top and on the bottom, They were very large, and so the shoes are dug in, the hobnails, the layers of leather, and you'd get behind it, and here comes the flaming arrows. And the shield will keep them from getting to you. So this wasn't the kind of, the shoes weren't the kind of shoes you would take off running with, and the shield wasn't like you see maybe the kids with their video games running around I don't know, when, we, when our kids were little, it was Donkey Kong or something, you know. <laughs> now I don't, I don't even know what that all is going on in those video games. But No, this was a big shield you would just get behind. And they would actually douse it with water before the battle started because it had to put out fire. And I'll talk about that when we get to the fiery darts. And so... I think the only adequate shield is God himself and his mighty gospel promises. And the shield of faith is our trust in God, not our trust in ourselves. I like a fellow in Mark uh, when Jesus was talking about faith and he said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Only God can help us. Let's go to Ephesians 6, 16b. With which you can extinguish 
all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, these flaming darts could be, it's more than a dart, but spears, javelins, arrows, because the enemy wanted to use everything possible to get that shield destroyed so they could kill you. So the the soldier is dug in, holding a massive heavy shield he couldn't run with, covered with wood, then animal skins, then canvas, strips of metal, and then doused in water. So these spears were wrapped with flammable material, which would also be covered with pitch and set on fire. The shield was often soaked with water and sometimes with fresh calfskins because they didn't want to burn. So you had to be able to take whatever they had to throw at you and extinguish it so that your shield would hold up in one piece. And the enemy would not be able to penetrate the soldiers behind these massive shields. So can, I mentioned, that word in in English is translating the Greek word dunamai, which is the power of ability. So you need the shield of faith. God told Abram, I'm your shield. You need the shield of faith so you have the ability to extinguish the fiery darts or arrows or javelins. And that's why this has to be objective. It's our faith in God. He's the object of our faith. He's the giver of the promises. He's the one who made us one new man. He's the one who gave us a foundation on which to stand as the church. And he's the one who will give us victory over the accuser who accuses day and night. And so if our faith is in God, we have the shield, the fiery arrows designed to destroy us will be extinguished and not burn up our massive shield. So um, let's go back. If you want to, turn back to Ephesians 4, 22-24. I like doing reviews because I go slowly through the Bible, so sometimes it's a year later uh, before I get to a different verse, and I'm referring back to one that maybe you weren't even here a year ago or whenever it was. I was in Ephesians 2 or whenever I was in Ephesians 4. So let's turn to Ephesians 4.22. And the point I'm making on my slide here is that the evil one will tempt us to trust the old man rather than put on the new man which has been created in holiness. So let's read that. This is a review of what we preached earlier. Ephesians 4.22 That you take off, according to your former way of life, the old man who is being destroyed according to deceitful desires. So the old man... Adam, the new man, by the way, is Christ. We're either in Adam or in Christ. Okay? Ephesians 2 1. You were dead. In Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15 22. In Christ all are made alive. The old man, Adam. Fiery darts are going to burn him right up. The new man is in Christ. As you take off according to your former way of life, the old man who is being destroyed according to deceitful desires. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, and put on, there's a clothing analogy here, the new man in accordance with God who is created, the new man is created in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So the new man created in righteousness, holiness from the truth. Satan's darts, arrows, javelins, spears, lit on fire, trying to destroy us, 
are all attacking our standing in Christ. If you trust in self, you live according to the old man, it's going to burn you all right up. If you believe the promises of God and stand firm in the faith, trusting in Christ alone will stand firm. That's what it's all about. I have some applications that will help us with that. So, faith in God and his promises through the gospel is our power to stand and extinguish the burning arrows that would otherwise destroy us. Now, let's go to some applications. Three of them. We must have peace with God or the battle is lost. In fact, we're already defeated. If we don't have peace with God, we're already defeated. We're dead. Ephesians 2. Number two, believers are always under attack. But are not in the realm of the evil one. Number three, we are able to overcome the accuser because of faith in God's finished work on our behalf. Let's go to Romans 5, 1. I want to preach the gospel that I've been telling you is so necessary. Maybe some haven't yet put their faith in Christ and have peace with God. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every time I preach on this verse or read it or think about it or remember um, it was my wonderful privilege in seminary to study hermeneutics under Dr. Uh, Robert Stein and he has a book on hermeneutics that I couldn't have studied under a better teacher to tell you the truth and I remember him um, we were t- we we're talking about range of meaning so uh, the first little take home assignment he gave us was Romans 5 1. What does Romans what does peace mean in Romans 5 1? Well, see, because of popular American evangelicalism, he knew that most of the students are going to get it wrong. And the reason for that is that they tend to think it means a serenity or um, peace of mind. I feel good and happy and hopeful, or something like that. And certainly peace can mean serenity, but what does it mean here? So I was so glad to get that because I thought, good, I'm going to get off on a good foot. I wrote back immediately, this means the reconciliation of previous enemies. So I got an A on my first paper. But most people get it wrong because they just haven't heard that taught. Why? Because evangelicalism wants to downplay how bad the situation was when we were the old man. In fact, they so want to attract people into the church, they redefine everything. So I, I wrote a book called Redefining Christianity. Come in to the church and have a better existence, a happier life, and have peace. And we'll have a little less turmoil. We'll have better peace of mind. But they're not saying to people that if you don't know Christ, you're actually an enemy of God. And in serious need of repentance. Oh, no, we're not going to preach that because it might offend somebody. So they smooth everything over, make it sound good like famously Robert Schuller did back in the 80s. I know I need to find new illustrations because Robert Schuller is no longer, there's no crystal cathedral anymore, and that's all old news, but he started this idea. But that's not what it means here. And how do you find out the range of meaning? How do you know what it means here? Well, you read the context. And this implies reconciliation with God, not a mental state of serenity. 
you may end up with a peaceful mind. But that's not what it means here. Why? Why is that so important? For this reason. The new age is telling people they can have peace by doing yoga. Or by believing all is one. Or by going into the new age movement. And so there's all of these people looking for peace through Eastern religion, oneness with nature, all is one, meditation, all of this stuff. And they have no clue what this verse is talking about because they don't believe that they're enemies with God because they believe God is part and parcel of the creation. And so they go out into the woods and feel oneness with nature and interpret that to be peace with God, and they don't even know Christ. They're enemies with God, and that won't even become apparent to them until the final judgment. And so that's why we got to preach the gospel, or we're not helping anybody. And they'll go get their serenity out in the woods. They don't need me for that, me the preacher or any other preacher. But how about getting reconciled to God? Well, we need the gospel of peace. Let's go on, turn uh, to Romans 5, 9, and 10. Let's look at that and see how the context helps us understand meaning. There's a legitimate range of meaning. Peace is a fruit of the Spirit. And that's within the range of meaning, but you don't have the fruit of the Spirit if you're not reconciled to God. You got to start at the beginning. Are you reconciled to God? Then we'll talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Romans 5, 9, and 10. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, I've preached on this over the decades, and I've called this section the tenses of salvation. Look at the tenses. In Romans 5, 1, having been justified is uh, an heiress participle. It means a point in time in the past. That would be when you came to faith. Then it says, we have peace. That's the present tense in the Greek and in English. And then we go down to 5, 9, and 10, having been justified, again, which sort of um, or brackets this whole section by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Let's stop right there, Romans 5, 9. Shall be saved from the wrath of God. Why doesn't that get preached? Because it doesn't make people feel good. Furthermore, this post-millennial, which Eric was talking about in Sunday school, I had a great Sunday school class, as those who were there know. Um, people want to believe everything's getting better and better now in history. The New Age, the Buddhism, the... Eastern religion, there's this whole view, socialism, progressivism, call it what you will, <laughs> thinks that everything's getting better and heading toward paradise. Or that history is a spiral, spiraling up toward heaven, the staircase to heaven, as the popular song went. But the Bible teaches that history is linear. It starts with creation, then the fall, and it is heading toward judgment. And so Paul very much is telling us that the future is the wrath of God in future judgment that will be poured out. Eric was talking about that in Sunday school. But if we're now trusting Christ, we have been justified we do have peace with God. We are justified by his blood. And we shall be saved from the wrath of God. 
we shall be saved. Judgment is certain, but we've already been rescued from it. And we have a future in heaven. By the way, that's mocked. I'm reading some contemporary theologians, um, his new perspectives on Paul, or the emergent, I wrote about that. They're all saying the same thing. They're making fun of us. They're mocking us. What a bunch of fools. All they, all they think it is about is going to heaven when you die. How pathetic. We've got to get things fixed now. So nuts to go to heaven when you die. Well, these theologians, if they're unbelieving, as they think they are, are going to finally face a day when they wished they were going to heaven when they died. They make fun of us now. But they're fools. Because being reconciled to God implies being saved from future wrath. That's real. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. So there it is. That helps us understand verse 1. Reconciled enemies. We may have thought we were nice people trying to help everybody. Sounds romantic and nice, but we were God's enemies. I didn't believe I was God's enemy, even though I was acting like one, until after I got saved. Paul probably didn't think he was the enemy of God when he was breathing out slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He thought he was doing God a favor until he met Christ on the road uh, and he had the vision. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? And so reconciled enemies is what it is about peace with God. And that happens through the death of his son. The wrath of God was poured out on his sinless son who willingly bore it, who paid the penalty for sin by pouring out his own blood, having it poured out, and by being crucified, dead, buried, and bodily raised on the third day as he predicted and bodily ascended to heaven. The creator of the universe, God the Son, the virgin-born Son of God, who also lived a sinless life. That one paid the penalty for sin. Today, repent and believe the gospel. Put your trust totally in Jesus Christ and only in Jesus Christ and nowhere else. Trust in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And that's reconciliation with God. That's peace with God. And then you actually have the armor of God. And you'll be able to stand because you're right with God. Believe on Jesus Christ today. Today's the day to have peace with God. Let's go to 1 John 5, 18 and 19. I have to tell you that the more this two-domain idea, the divine counsel idea that I've been talking about and Eric has been, um, the more I see that, the more difficult passages become uh, understandable and clear to me. And this is one. Some people consider this a difficult passage. And I have I struggled with it for decades as a preacher, but now it makes perfect sense. So let me tell you why it at least makes sense to me now, based on this two-domain idea. 1 John 5, 18 and 19. We know that no one who is born of God sins. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. And we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now let me unpack that a little bit. No one who is born of God sins. Now that sparks a debate about whether sinless perfection is already true, which it is not. Or does it mean no one who's born of God sins a lot, they just sin a little? Or no one born of God 
is you know, a really, really horrendous, terrible sinner, which is certainly true. But what does it mean here? Let me put that with another verse you find in Revelation, also written by John. <clears throat> it talks about the inhabitants of hell. And all liars will have their place in the pit. All liars. That would also cause us to come up short. Well, does any human being always speak always the truth no matter what? That's why they have oaths in court. They're trying to get liars to tell the truth at least this time. All right? So what is that all about? Well, see, let's think about the two domains. One domain is under Christ. In order to enter his domain, you do so by faith through the gospel. And according to Colossians 1, 13 and 14, we're transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Those who have been transferred, you could also look this up, Acts 26, 18, from darkness to light, the kingdom of darkness and so on, we go into the light of Christ and his gospel. And so here we stand. Once you're transferred into the domain of Christ, thank you, brother, we're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. Now, sinners are in the domain of darkness. Saints are under the authority of Christ. They're in the domain of light. So what John is saying, I believe, in the, because he's talking about the two domains here, we are of God, is that your sins being forgiven, that you're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, you're under, out of the darkness of Satan, you are in Christ. And... It's never sinful to be in Christ. We're not perfected. We don't have our glorified bodies. But standing in Christ is never sinful. And the blood of Jesus is continually cleansing us from all sin. So what it's saying is we're in that domain of Christ. We are of God. He was he who was born of God, an unusual way of saying it, but speaking of Christ, clear from the context, keeps him, keeps. Um, I'm going to refer, I'll just cite this for you for the sake of time. John 17, 12. Jesus' prayer, he says, when I was with them, I kept them in your name, which, which you have given to me, and guarded them. This is Jesus praying to the Father about the disciples. Continuing, John 17, 12, And none of them has perished except the son of destruction in order that the scripture would be fulfilled. So none perished but Judas. And Judas never was of them. They went out of us, from us because they were not of us. Judas was always in the domain of darkness. It's the only place he ever was. Peter was in the domain of Christ, and when he fell and sinned, he was restored. So a Christian in the domain of Christ may fall, but will always be restored. The Judases of the world leave and don't come back. They're in darkness. No one born of God sins, meaning you are kept by Christ. You will not perish. The accusations of Satan are not going to land because legally you have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Therefore, the evil one does not touch you. Now, what is wrong about much teaching is that people are thinking of geography rather than spiritual relationships. Let me tell you what I mean. 
let me explain it this way. There is no geographical place that you can travel to that once you get there, now you're not in the domain of Satan. Okay? Well, they've been trying to create it. Do you think if you had a bedroom at the Vatican, Satan wouldn't get you? Oh, you don't think that? Uh, no. Look at what it says here. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, that's talking about the world and its sinful rebellion against God, cosmos. But it would also apply geographically. There's not any place in the world that Satan can't go. All right? So it's not geographical. It's relational. And so we are in Christ. John 17, 15. Let me read another verse from Jesus' prayer to the Father. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. So we're still in the world, the whole world that lies in the power of the evil one, but we're kept from him. You no use moving to a different country thinking there it's all Christian. It's not. You can't get away by travel. You get away by faith. You get into the realm of Christ and you stand and you have that helm of salvation. You have the shield of faith and uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. And there we stand. And that's how we stand under the onslaught of the evil one. Christ keeps us. We are not in Satan's realm of sin, but in Christ's realm of righteousness. Now, let me make a few statements before we end with a verse from Revelation. First of all, I've already said all Christians will come back like Peter did. The Judases will go and be happy to be gone. But that is not saying you should just stay in sin. God will test his own severely if that's what it takes to get us back. So here's my statements. Number one, these are spiritual realms and they coexist throughout the geographical world. Certainly some places are darker than others because of the lack of salt and light, because there's so few Christians or some pagan religion is predominant, but you are never going to travel somewhere where you're not kept by God. Okay, number two, the only way out of Satan's domain is through the blood atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Number three, no action is necessary to languish in evil. If you're dead and you like it that way, you can languish away. You were born into it. In Adam, all died. But we need to put our faith in Christ if we're going to get free from the evil one. Number Four, God uses means. And the armor of God is the means he uses to keep us from the evil one. This is about being kept from the evil one. I know the teachers are saying that's pretty pathetic. Because they have the idea that we're actually going to rule over the evil one ourselves in this life. And we're going to be the ones that tell Satan what to do. I covered that in a previous sermon. No, we need to stand in Christ. Christ is in charge of the spiritual world. We need to stand in him. Then we are above all things that would harm us because we're in Christ. One last slide, and we'll close with this. And I'm, I'm not going to expound on everything in here, but I want us to see it and think about it. Revelation 12, 10b through 11. This is a proleptic statement, by the way, stated as true already, even though it's yet future. It's found in Revelation 12. Eric mentioned it in his Sunday school. Here, it's, here it goes. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been 
thrown down. He who accuses them, notice the singular there, that's how we know it's proleptic, plus what happens in Revelation going forward until the end. He accuses them before our God day and night. One of my Bible college teachers says, well, one thing about Satan, he does stick to his job. It's a very bad job, but he sticks to it. He doesn't quit. He'll just keep doing it. Accuses them before our God day and night. And notice this. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. The sword of the persecutor has never been able to remove faith from the heart of a Christian. History has demonstrated that. It's not that we can sit here and say, oh, I would never deny him. Well, Peter said that, but and he did. It had to be restored. No, God will keep us. They love Christ. The blood of Jesus cleanses our sins. They're confessing him, and nothing will change that. Today, confess Christ, trust Christ, Christ, stand with your sheet, feet shod and that shield to put out those fiery darts and you are safe. You are safe in Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for your goodness and your kindness and mercy. Thank you that though we are undeserving, you sent your son for us and rescued us. May we take to heart everything you've said and stand in faith, trusting you alone, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. I will take the benediction from Jude, as we often do, because it's pertinent to what we've been talking about. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.